readers. Welcome to this Foxed page uh, deep dive into one of my favorite childhood favorites. These um, explorations of these childhood favorites are so excellent for me because I, you know, I was a reader as a kid, like a lot of us were. There was actually not a lot else to do, you know, when we were little. Uh, but but I found that that these there were several books that stayed with me, and one of them, of course, was "Are You There, God?" It's me, Margaret. It feels like the book of a generation in many ways, and I wanted to go back and revisit some of these books that felt so formative because they're books that continue to be in print. They're books that, you know, my daughter read when she was young and my sons, um, they're, they're books that were, that were foundational for me and that have continued to resonate. And I was very curious about whether or not they would hold up from kind of a literary standpoint. And let me tell you, Judy Bloom definitely stands up from a literary standpoint. She is having a moment there's an incredible documentary about her, which I highly recommend. It's very well done, some kind of twisty, turny stuff in that documentary, and just a really engrossing and inspirational vision of this woman and, and sort of, you know, the superstar behind the books. It also really speaks to the impact of all of the books. Margaret was certainly my favorite, although I also loved Forever. Um, and I also loved Deanie, but I totally didn't get the masturbation thing. It was so subtle that I just like, I don't know. I just whoosh, no. It just was all about the back brace for me with Deanie. Had nothing to do with masturbation. Uh, but I really appreciate the fact that that you know Judy Bloom is being recognized right now as as a master, not only of of the form of the you know the young adult book or the juvenile book or whatever we call this books for middle schoolers, uh, but but also books that are highly adaptable. So Margaret is being made into a movie and forever is being made i mean, don't know what's happening with the writer strike but forever is now being made into a television series so i'm i'm very happy about this idea judy bloom is really old she does not look old but she's i don't know late 80s and i'm so happy that she's having this very well deserved moment um you know and, and is able to really be conscious of of the impact that she continues to make so are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, again, was a totally beloved book. I think it's really funny that all I remember from the book uh, is the whole question about periods. I had I was a very late menstruator, so I was very, very interested in the whole thing. And so I really identified with Margaret and this feeling of like, when is this going to come and what is it going to be like? And so I had that very, all of that I really related to and certainly remembered. Like for me, it was a book that was synonymous with menstruation and having your period and all of the drama that goes with that. But I also had two things that I remembered really specifically. One was a polo shirt because I did not know what a polo shirt was. I think we just grew up in t-shirts like this one that I'm wearing from 1973 in honor of uh, Roe v. Wade. But, um, you know, I'm, I, there was the, the polo shirt mystery and then I didn't understand what an A&P was. I think it's a grocery store is my best, that's sort of my thing. One of the girls, the one who's more developed, goes behind the A&P with boys. And I, you know, I was able to sort of infer that this was probably some sort of 7-Eleven. And I was, I, you know, I understood the idea that that this, she had this sort of reputation, as we said back in the day, for, for going behind the A&P with boys, which of course was not the case in New Jersey, apparently an A and P is is uh, you know it's their equivalent to a Seven Eleven. So all I remembered was the period stuff, the A and P, and the polo shirt. There's a lot more to Margaret. It turns out. So one of the surprises that was so gratifying for me is that, and and I shouldn't have been surprised by this because I think it's one of the reasons why this is like a a very you know, a book that has incredible staying power. I also shouldn't be surprised because it's literally in the title. But this book is very much about religion and it's about faith and it's about God. I mean, and not God. I mean, it is God with a capital G, but it's like, it doesn't feel like some sort of heavy handed capital G God. It feels like God, like it feels like faith and the idea of something larger and the idea of some sort of spiritual, you know, communion. So I was like, Wow, she, Judy Bloom, turns out that Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret is really a lot about God in this incredibly skillful way. So um, I really dug right back in. 
And let me tell you, if you do feel like rereading this book, it takes like an hour. Um, but I, I dug in and I was very interested in the menstruation piece because, of course, that is what I remember. Also interested in the polo shirt and the A&P. But I was really taken as an adult by the religious angst and the religious difficulties that poor Margaret is facing and the grace, no pun intended, with which uh, Judy Bloom handles all of that. So there was so much tension in the book also because all of you know I have the worst memory. Like I just have such a shitty memory. So I couldn't remember any of the plot. I didn't know when she was going to get her period. I didn't know, you know, that the other girl was going to lie. Like there were all of these things that were so surprising to me besides the polo and the A&P. But one of the main tensions that I was feeling, one of the kind of main questions for me is like, what is Judy going to do with this whole God question? Like, I assumed that Judy wasn't going to come down with some sort of religious treatise because that really, I think, would not have had the staying power and it would not have appealed to me, I don't think, even as like a 10-year-old. But I was so curious. I mean, this is a very large question. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. She's asking this question and all of a sudden I was like, wait, Judy Bloom is going to answer the question of whether or not God is there. Like it was so, it was so tense and it was so well done the way that Judy did in fact handle that question. So I, I um, was thoroughly engrossed and I understood why as a, as a kid and as a kid who grew up in a very agnostic household, my older brother and I were uh, baptized Episcopalian and then my parents totally like ran out of steam and my younger two siblings like no. So, uh, you know, as a kid who was very fearful about death and who was very interested in in sort of not theology and not theological sort of stuff, but was very interested in the idea of God on some level, um, I'm surprised that this didn't resonate more. Uh, I was just too focused maybe on my period. Okay. So when we talk about the religious stuff in the book, it's really well done. So there's this deep family division for Margaret. Margaret's family is Christian. They are in fact so Christian that Margaret's mother is an only child. And when Margaret's Christian mother from, I think, Iowa or Indiana or Ohio, that's, I'm sorry, I apologize to all three of those states, but she's from the Midwest and she's from a, like a very Christian family who then disowns her and refuses to like ever see her husband. So th there's this, like, it's not just religious strife, it's like very serious religious estrangement that has happened. And uh, Margaret's father is Jewish and Sylvia, who is Margaret's grandmother on her paternal side, who is also Jewish, really is pushing Margaret to really embrace her Judaism and to view herself as a Jew, like really like as a Jewish person and not as a Christian. There seems to be very little room uh, in this grandparents world, all of the grandparents, for, for any kind of compromise. So poor Margaret is not only stuck in the middle of this kind of family tug of war that has very high stakes, and she loves her grandmother, Sylvia. Sylvia's rad, Sylvia's great but Sylvia really seems to want Margaret to, to really embrace Judaism. So you have this family strife, but you also have Margaret engaged in a school project that is given to them on the part of their male teacher, who I loved the character of the male teacher because he's bumbling and he's also like kind of a lech and he's always staring at the girl who is fully developed, who goes behind the a &P, supposedly, which of course is not in fact, the case. That's a rumor, um, as will happen among, you know, young teens and preteens. But their their male teacher, it's his first year teaching. And I just I think Judy Bloom does such a good job of capturing that that sort of as an adult, you're like, oh my gosh, like, oh, it's so it's so cringy. And as a kid, you also remember for us, it was the computers teacher in high school at my all girls school. We literally made him cry. Like his name was Brian Stoltz. We literally made him cry. I mean, the poor, the poor man. So I really, I really was feeling for um, this character that Judy created, which is the sign of an amazing novelist. So he assigns this school year project where you have to do something that's very personal and you have for the entire year, you have to have all these experiences and research and fixate. So Margaret decides that she is going to do this about God and religion. And she's going to figure out if she goes to like, the Jewish summer camp or the Christian one. And she's going to figure out if she's going to go to temple or she's going to go to church. So, so it's this real preoccupation, 
that is so skillfully structured. You have both the family pressure and then you also have this school structure. Like the scaffolding is so smart on the part of uh, Judy Bloom. Meanwhile, the whole time the tension is ratcheting up because you're like, where is Judy going to come down here? You know, I mean, like, what exactly are we meant to think about God? Like, are you there, God? Um, so uh, it's masterful. We are going to go on to talk now a little bit about um, about why the prose is actually kind of delightful to look at as an adult, but also why I think it really had very strong appeal as a kid. So one of the things that she does so well is quite a bit like the television show Mad Men. So I read this thing, um, an interview by with Matthew Weiner, who is the creator of that show, and he talked about Mad Men as, as being um, from essentially from a, a young child's perspective. Like as the viewer, you're, you're sort of in the position of this young child and you really don't understand what is happening in this world of adults. And that's part of the reason why the show feels distanced. And it's part of the reason why it, things are sort of inscrutable and, and really captivating is because there's this real sort of, um, you know, there's like a regression that happens and you get to be kind of a child again, looking at this world of advertising in the early 60s. In this case, we have that same sort of thing. There are lots of allusions to what is happening in the adult world. And yet as, um, you know, we're essentially like with Margaret, we're aligned with Margaret in terms of our perspective. It's a first person narration. A lot of it is epistolary. So it's Margaret writing letters to God. Um, but but it's it's we're definitely in line with Margaret. And we're trying to figure out not only whether God exists, and will communicate with us, but also uh, what's happening in this adult world that she is essentially about to enter, both in terms of menstruation, but also in terms of her Jewish faith. You know, she's about to turn 13. It, it, you know, there's a lot of, or I guess she's about to turn 12, but you know, she's coming up on a time when I think probably the bat mitzvah was not a huge thing at, at this point in time. I don't know. Uh, but meaning bar mitzvahs were, but I think things were a little bit sexist back then and there were maybe fewer, plus the fact that, you know, this is a family that is heavily divided in terms of religion. But you do have this sense of, of uh, Margaret as being kind of like aware of what's happening in the adult world and not fully understanding it in a way that is so appealing. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to dive in to the beginning of the text here. I, I wish, you know, check out my Instagram uh, at the Fox page and so that you can see the cover of my copy. It is so 70s. I mean, it's like, it's kind of like soft yellows and purples and it's like this, she's blonde in it, which is kind of weird and has like this long hair and it's so nostalgic. I look at it and it is as if I am 10 years old again. But we're going to dive in. This is such a cool copy. There are a lot of really appealing copies of this book, which I love. And there are plenty of them in the bookstore and they're, they're real big sellers, which has never not been the case. Okay, we're diving into page one. We're going to read this very first part up at the top. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. We're moving today. I'm so scared, God. I've never lived anywhere but here. Suppose I hate my new school. Suppose everybody there hates me. Please help me, God. Don't let New Jersey be too horrible. Thank you. Okay, a couple of things. So this this um, this series of questions that she's asking would be so helpful in terms of aligning herself, um, you know, the narrator, aligning herself with a child. These are questions that are so universal. I mean, the idea of moving when you're in, you know, going into sixth grade would be, I didn't have to do it. It would have been so awful. And and it, I think it very easily, though, is the kind of stress that you would be able to sort of identify with and, and, and sort of place onto whatever it was that was bothering you. So this series of questions, of course, beginning with this whopper, I mean, she's not saying like, dear God, blah, blah, blah. She's like, are you there, God? Like it's literally the first line of the novel is this whopper of a question that, that I think is is part of the reason why the, you know, the, the, the tension is both for kids and adults. Like it's, it's literally like one of the biggest questions and she's just asking it in such a bold and awesome way. But then we get down to this part, um, and it's very beseeching, this please help me, God. I mean, this is a kid who's who's in, not a crisis, but a kid who's under quite a bit of stress. I love this, don't let New Jersey be too horrible. 
I mean, poor New Jersey, like New Jersey is so beautiful and it is rightfully called the garden state. And there are parts of it that are gorgeous, but everyone loves to shit on New Jersey. It's so sad. This is a kid who's living in New York. And, you know, of course there's that like New York, New Jersey thing that is just, you know, there's that, but there's also just this kind of, I mean, for me growing up, like New Jersey was not the place that I wanted to live, but I love how um, kind of bold she is about it. Please, sorry, don't let New Jersey be too horrible. I mean, it just it, for some reason, and again, I think as an older person, th there's a certain amount of humor in that. And then thank you. So this is a kid who's also gracious and, and again, is not in like a crazy crisis. This is just, you know, she's, she's giving thanks and she's asking for some kind of communion and some sort of guidance. Okay, and then we're gonna dive into the actual text. And this is Margaret, again, it's a first person narration. And it begins with the first person plural, we, but then it very quickly gets into this I narration, which again is very appealing. And I think that's somewhat standard, you know, third person and first person both being appealing to young readers. We moved on the Tuesday before Labor Day. I knew what the weather was like the second I got up. I knew because I caught my mother sniffing under her arms. I mean, I read that and I just was like, this is genius. This is genius. I mean, she's Margaret. I mean, Margaret. Yes, Margaret is asking this very large question. And then she's getting to this thing about um, really exactly what Matthew Weiner was talking about with Mad Men. Like you sort of are beginning at 10, 11, you know, beginning to really be curious about the way your body is going to be changing. And there would be things about the adult world that as an adult, you just would not think about, but that are so important and, and, and intriguing and mystifying for kids. And so there is, you know, the idea of deodorant and the idea of wearing a bra, like those were such a big deal to me. Like I really wanted to wear deodorant and I really wanted to wear a bra. And my mom was like, what? Like you don't need either of those things when I was literally like 16, which was a bummer. But um, I mean, not really, but close. So, but she, but this idea of like this mother sniffing under her arms is so, um, it's really, there's a level of candor that is so appealing. And also uh, just this kind of um, dovetailing of, of this adult world and then also this kid world. I don't think these are, these are not like YA books that are meant to appeal to adults so much. This is very, and Judy Bloom is very clear about the fact that she is writing for kids, but the, because it's kind of a lot of kids who are straddling this kind of, you know, this adult world and this child world, they're, they're indications of the adult world that I think are, are part of the reason why they are so appealing. It's, it's really giving you a window into why a parent might be smelling under their arms. Okay, um, we are going to look at page two, up at the top here on page two. I was really surprised when I came home from camp and found out our New York apartment had been rented to another family and that we owned a house in Farbrook, New Jersey. Okay, so uh, first of all, I was like, wow, her parents kind of did a number on her. I mean, maybe that was a good move, but it seems like kind of a crazy surprise to, to I mean, I, you know, whatever, my parents may have done this too. It was, you know, this is the, what is this, the, the late 60s? I think parents made these unilateral decisions and then they told you at the last minute. So, but she's she's coming home from camp. She finds out that an, already another person is um, in her house. And this idea of Farbrook, New Jersey is so good. Um, you know, Judy Bloom is using all of the different tools that are available to writers. And one of them are names. So this idea of um, Farbrook, first of all, it's far, it's very far away. And this idea of brooking something, like I won't brook any guff, I think is one of those expressions, like I, I won't allow anything. Um, so there's this idea of, of, of having to sort of uh, allow something, but also the idea of a stream or a brook and the idea of, of um, having like a division and having, um, you know, this idea of, of uh, a far brook, like there's something so rural about that too, that is, that is very, uh, you know, it's in direct contrast with their New York City apartment. First of all, I'd never even heard of Farbrook. And second of all, I'm not usually left out of important family decisions. My memory's so shitty, I didn't even remember that. But apparently she's usually not left out of them. And then this is a decision that she was left out of, which is momentous. And I think also in some really intelligent ways, Judy Bloom is, is sort of, um, you know, not hedging her bets, but she's kind of covering all of her bases to mix a couple metaphors uh, in the sense that, you know, if you're a kid who is normally 
you know, part of your family's decisions, or if you're not, you'll be able to relate to what Margaret is going through. But when I groaned, why New Jersey? I was told Long Island is too social, Westchester is too expensive, and Connecticut is too inconvenient. So again, like, especially as a kid who was in California, like I would not have understood any of that. Talk about polo shirts and the AP, A and P. Like I just, I would not have known. As an adult, it's such a good synthesis of like why you would be in New Jersey. It's also again, kind of shitting on New Jersey because New Jersey is not in fact Westchester and Long Island and all of these other and Connecticut, you know. So, uh, but, but again, this is that adult world that is kind of just plunked down in the novel in front of Margaret in ways that are not explained to the to the reader and they're not really explained to her because the nuance doesn't matter but the nuance is important especially um you know for certain readers or for older readers that stuff is uh more significant okay and then we're going to look at um across here on the bottom of this page anyhow i figured this house in new jersey business is my parents way of getting me away from grandma she doesn't have a car, she hates buses, and she thinks all trains are dirty. So unless grandma plans to walk, which is unlikely, I won't be seeing much of her. Now some kids might think, who cares about seeing a grandmother? But Sylvia Simon is a lot of fun considering her age, which I happen to know is 60. Okay, what I loved about that in part is that is 60 is on the next page. And in my mind, the grandmother was literally like 89 you know, because that's kind of where I, well, my grandparents are dead now, but like I, you know, like in my mind as a 53 year old grandparents are much, much older. Grandparents are not 60, although my parents were grandparents at 60. But this this idea of, um, again, glimpsing this adult world, and it's such a great representation of Sylvia. Like in this one deft paragraph, we have this amazing sense of like what this family schism, like how deep the schism goes because they need to get her away from this beloved grandmother. But we also already have Sylvia as this kind of heroic figure. And Margaret understands it's like maybe a little geeky to be wanting to hang out with her grandmother, but you know, Margaret has her convictions and they tell her that Sylvia is fun to be with considering that she's 60. Ouch. Okay, so we're gonna um, move on from this notion of this kind of strangeness that uh, with this like adult world that Margaret is just beginning to understand. And we're gonna move on to some of the, the just delightful pieces of this and some of the humor in the book. Okay, so this is, uh, we're at the bottom of page 111, the very, very bottom. This is a, um, the, the sort of that important scene that is, I think, even in the trailer of the movie. And it's a very memorable scene when the sex ed teacher comes and she's teaching the, all of the kids about menstruation. And I think the way that she pronounces menstruation, you know, ends up being this whole thing. Um, my house was very open and very, um, you know, kind of hippie-ish. And so... I don't remember ever having these kinds of conversations and I certainly don't remember like menstruation as, I mean, it was a mystery because I was waiting and waiting and waiting, but it was not a mystery in terms of like, I didn't think the word menstruation was weird, although we didn't really use that word as much. Okay, down at the bottom, this is in her auditorium and all the kids are together. There was a late, oh no, sorry, this is the boys and the girls are separated, of course, because that's what would have happened in the late sixties. There was a lady on the stage Dressed in a gray suit, she had a big behind. Also, she wore a hat, which is so funny. She had a big behind. Also, she wore a hat. Like, I just am so charmed and so kind of amused by this. I'm also amused, speaking of hats, when when um, we're doing much more religious kind of, uh, you know, exploration later in the book, Margaret, she goes to church and she goes to temple. And in both, she's more interested in sort of counting the hats. There are a bunch of different hats in both of those settings. And she's looking at the hats and counting them and checking out the colors because she's really left cold by organized religion, which is no surprise because, frankly, I think um, Judy Bloom was really disenchanted with the patriarchy in all of its forms and certainly with, uh, you know, organized religion and, 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 and sort of um, the pieces of society that were really meaning to sort of enclose women and, and sort of dictate the way that people should be acting and feeling. So we have the woman with the big bottom and the hat and her gray suit. It's like, that's all you need to know. It's so good. Then down a little bit more, she says, the, the woman with the big bottom, I'm here today to tell you about what every girl should know 
brought to you as a courtesy of the Private Lady Company. We'll talk some more after the film. Her voice was smooth, like a radio announcer's. So if you don't happen to have your copy in front of you, um, what every girl should know is italicized. So we know that it is um, you know, a film that they're about to show. And then um, Private Lady Company is in capital letters because this woman, um, you know, she, she has brought the film by, you know, uh, um, uh, as a courtesy of the private lady company. So it's so funny to me because this whole thing is this giant shill on the part of this one company. Like Judy Bloom is doing such a good job of like taking down like this weird advertising, um, like capitalist gnarly thing where they're like, you know, taking advantage of all these young girls who are about to start menstruating. So down a little bit further, the film told us about the ovaries and explained why girls menstruate. It's written out in a funny way. But it didn't tell us how it feels, except to say that it is not painful, which we knew anyway. Also, it didn't really show a girl getting it. It just said how wonderful nature was and how we would soon become women and all that. After the film, the lady in the gray suit asked if there were questions. Nancy raised her hand, and when gray suit called on her, Nancy said, how about Tampax? I mean, I love Nancy. Well, Nancy later becomes a little problematic, but um, I, you know, this is that's what you're wondering about as a young girl in this age. I mean, I think now we have a much better understanding, but like, I mean, back in the day, even kids my age, right, when you first got it, you could use Tampax. But like, think about how political that was. Like to have young girls, you know, inserting something into their vagina was like such a problem for people. So she says, gray suit coughed into her hanky. Love it. I mean, this is Judy just like really pushing um, this, this kind of uptight woman in her suit and her big behind. We don't advise internal protection until you're considerably older. Such a bad answer. I mean, it's what somebody would say. And internal protection is all uh, italicized. And honestly, for a lot of girls, that was probably just confusing and like a lot of kind of mumbo jumbo as it is. I mean, this just is not, it's not a great answer. I mean, it's a bad answer. Then Gray Suit came down from the stage and passed out booklets called What Every Girl Should Know. The booklet recommended that we use private lady sanitary supplies. It was like one big commercial. I made a mental note never to buy private lady things when and if I needed them. So I love it that this is like, first of all, it's uh, Judy Bloom just being like, of course, they're going to turn this into a weird capitalist opportunity for like a whole, you know, market, like a whole demographic of young girls. But then I love the fact that Margaret sees through it. Margaret's like, well, what's this whole commercial? I am not going to be buying this. Like that Margaret is a savvy, savvy consumer. And then on page 159, we have this really nice echo of this, um, which is a testament to the skill of Bloom. I mean, she's not just going to kind of like let that be the end of this hilarious moment. On 159, so she's on, on 59, uh, sorry, 159 here. She's in her closet and she's pretending to, um, or she's not pretending, she's like practicing with some contraband sanitary napkins, which is so relatable. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you're so curious about um, th that you really, like you, you go to these kind of funny lengths be because there is, there's mystery and there's intrigue and there's shame and there's embarrassment that goes with all of these changing body things. So in, um, in the middle of this paragraph, I stuck the pad between my legs and pulled up my underpants. I wanted to find out how it would feel. Now I knew. I liked it. I thought about sleeping with my pad that night, but decided against it. If there was a fire, my secret might be discovered. You guys, it's so good because that's exactly what you would think. Like, you'd be like, oh, I like this. I feel like an adult. I feel, you know, this is making me feel grown up. I'm understanding what's coming, you know, inexorably, like down the pike. But then like, what if the house burns down? It's so good because these are the kinds of, um, the, this is exactly, this is how you think that your secret, you know, would be discovered. I just loved it. Okay, there's also a part later, um, which I don't think we'll have time to touch on, where uh, later somebody does get their period and they talked about which brand they bought and they were very happy that it was not Private Lady. They went for like teen softies, I think they're called, with two E's, softies. Okay, 
So um, I want to touch on two more things before we close. One more thing before we close, which is how deftly um, Judy Bloom handles these sort of climaxes in the book. And by climaxes, I do not mean orgasms. I'm just with Dini, poor Dini. Um, but I'm, I mean, not poor Dini, good for Dini. She figured out how to masturbate, even at this horrible time when she had to wear her scoliosis brace. Um, but I want to talk about the climaxes in the literary sense, you know, sort of the, 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 the big uh, tense moments and how they kind of play out because of how deftly they are handled. So first of all, Nancy, who asked about the Tampax and who's very sort of, um, you know, she's one of, uh, she lives on, on Margaret Street and they're close. Maybe you remember Nancy. Um, Nancy writes a postcard and says that she got her period fairly early in the novel. Nancy lied. So it's, and I actually didn't remember this until I was reading it, but there's this point when they're all out to dinner, I think maybe even in New York City, it's a very sort of big event. And Nancy does get her period in the bathroom and she's very afraid. It's a really traumatic event for her. And so maybe also because she lied about it and Margaret's there and she now has to sort of confess that she lied, but mostly she just seems scared that she is getting her period, even though, you know, she's had a lot of, of, of information given to her maybe bad information from the woman in the gray suit, but you have this sense of like how a lot of young girls feel. So there's all this kind of drama with her mother, but Nancy uh, is not particularly reliable. And um, so, so there's that one piece, there's a whole storyline about, you know, who's going to get their period first and all of these girls. And, um, and Nancy, in fact, there, there's a lot of drama involved because she lies. And then when she gets it, it's very traumatic. There's also um, an interesting storyline where Margaret is paired up with this girl named Laura, who is the woman, well, she is kind of a young woman. She's a, she, at least physically, she is the, the only person in the class who has developed. She's very developed. I mean, that's that, that's that word that people used back then. She was like an early bloomer and she was very tall and she had huge boobs and she was uh, like very womanly. And the poor thing was getting totally like stared at by the other boys, of course, in the class, but then also by the teacher. And at one point they're doing some dancing and he uses her as the example because he says it's because she's tall enough, but you fully expect that he's like kind of lechy and gross and just wants to dance with her because she has a beautiful body. So this, and she's also the one who's supposed to go behind the A and P or, or you know, the rumor is that she's going behind the A and P with these boys. So when she and Margaret are paired together to work on their reports, Margaret essentially confronts her about this in a, in a fit of pique, in a moment of frustration, because it turns out Laura's not like a great working partner, which also is realistic. Um, and Margaret has this kind of strong reaction. And Laura is, you know, totally understandably furious. And then poor Margaret is racked with guilt because she made this assumption that is wrong about Laura which leads to some some sort of, um, you know, she goes to Laura's church and tries to make confession and is in fact just like scared of the priest. I'm giving a lot of um, plot here, but on purpose. So, and then there's the, so there's the storyline with Nancy and her period. There's the storyline with Laura and the A&P um, that ends up with Margaret feeling very bad and going to confession, which does not end well. And then another storyline is these dueling grandmothers and the fact that, you know, Margaret was very looking forward to being in Florida with her grandmother over spring break. But because the estranged maternal grandmother decides she wants to come into town, uh, Margaret has to change her plans and is very upset by this. So the amazing thing that Judy Bloom does is she sets all of these different plots in motion. They're all happening and they're all tense and intriguing and none of them is really resolved, which is so genius. You, the whole time you're like, how is she going to resolve these things, especially the God question? And literally none of them is resolved. So when Nancy, you know, instead of having this be some sort of, you know, after she's lied about the period and then she gets afraid when she actually has her period, at the end of the book, Margaret still doesn't really trust Nancy and Nancy's still kind of a bitch. Like it's, it's a, it's a, it's a relationship. You don't see a lot of change. There isn't this like very satisfying arc that happens. It's it's really the way life is in that, you know, you're left with, with sort of the same thing you started with and you're left with the same dissatisfactions that you had at the beginning. The exact same thing happens with Laura. 
when when Margaret makes this terrible assumption and says this terrible thing about Laura's reputation, I hope her name is Laura. I think that's right. Uh, but when that happens and she feels so bad and confession goes awry and she's afraid of this priest, which I mean, again, Margaret's kind of a shrewd, you know, shrewd kid. Um, it's not resolved. She doesn't get to feel better. There's no kind of magical kind of wrapping up and she and Laura do not become friends. And Laura does not like suddenly, I don't know, like in some weird 16 candles moment, you know, she doesn't sort of become accepted by the class. In fact, it just ends with Laura in the same place she was being awkward and, and really unfairly leered at. Same thing with the grandmothers. There's just not, there's not a lot of resolution to these big issues. It, and it's so, it's such a good choice on Judy Bloom's part, because even as a kid, even as a 10 year old, I mean, those things might've been satisfying and there's certainly a lot of room in literature for wish fulfillment. But I think even then I would have been like, really? Actually, then I probably would have been like, oh, that's so great. But I think part of the staying power of these books is this this kind of um, ability of Judy Bloom to not tie everything up with a ribbon and, and, and to allow things to be difficult and fraught because that's how life is, certainly when you are a middle schooler. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna look at is the close of the novel. So this is on page 170 and 172. We're right at the very end of this book. Okay, so down at the bottom here. So one of the other plot points that has been sort of brewing is that Margaret is uh, like semi uh, in love. I, I wanted to say like puppy love, which I don't know if that's too dismissive or not. Like it, it seems like actually kind of an apt term. Although what am I saying? Like I literally was, you know, in love with Brock Coffrin when I was in third grade and it, I used to like lie on the floor and listen to the Bee Gees um, and, and just was like, in so much pain and actually i was even like going steady with him like everything was great with him but i still was just like all full of kind of weird angst because i mean i was like nine nine ten something like that maybe it's fourth grade fifth grade i don't know but it was um it, you know love at that point new love is so intense even if you're just like holding hands or you're just like writing letters and notes in class so um, Margaret's having this kind of an infatuation, this kind of like a like an angsty love for the older brother of one of her neighborhood friends. His name is Moose, of course, uh, and he mows their lawn. And Margaret like sits inside and watches him mow the lawn. I mean, maybe this is all ringing a bell for you. I hope so because it is so good. Okay, down at the bottom here. Um, so this is uh, the climax that you might have been waiting for. I went back into the house. I had to go to the bathroom. I mean, honestly, right then I was like, okay, here it comes. I was thinking about Moose and how I liked to stand close to him. I was thinking that I was glad he wasn't a liar and I was happy that he cut our grass. Then I looked down at my underpants and I couldn't believe it. There was blood on them. Not a lot, but enough. I really hollered, mom, hey mom, come quick. When my mother got to the bathroom, she said, what is it? What's the matter? I got it, I told her. Got what? Which, of course, I mean, of course your mom is going to do that. I literally, I did not say that to my daughter. And I don't remember this with my mom, weirdly. Um, so her mom says, got what? I started to laugh and cry at the same time. Oh my God, I love it. My period, I've got my period. My nose started running and I reached for a tissue. It's so genius. Like it's, I mean, part of it's just like, you know, she's crying, the snot, the blood, like all of the, all of the bodily fluids, but, the, but it's such a genius. Um, like it's like a little awkward, the nose running and the grabbing of the tissue. Like it's just, a, it's, it's such a beautiful kind of, um, detail because it's helping us understand that this is like a real thing that's happening. This is the kind of detail that's so relatable that really makes it feel like a rich thing that's actually happening. Are you sure, Margaret? My mother asked. I mean, what's up with this mom, you know? Look, look at this, I said, showing her my underpants. My God, you've really got it, my little girl. Which, I mean, maybe. Then her eyes filled up and she started sniffling too. Wait a minute, I've got the equipment in the other room. I was going to put it in your camp trunk just in case. You were? Yes, just in case. She left the bathroom. 
which is so sweet too, because you get this sense here, like this is not a mom and daughter who communicate a lot. Interesting sidebar, the mom is a painter and the mom is a very frustrated painter who is really wanting to create her art and just like never is quite able to, which is a very obvious stand-in for Judy Bloom and for every mom who has any kind of aspiration to do anything other than raise children. Uh, but this idea that that Margaret is very sort of like touched, that's what how I am interpreting it, by the fact that her mother is sort of feeling like she was ready, you know, for this momentous occasion. And her mother, in fact, did believe that she was like normal and that one day her period would come. So she goes in and she's going to get the, the products from the other room. Uh, when she came back, I asked her, is that private lady stuff? No, I got you teenage softies. Wait, it's not with two E's. I'm so disappointed. In my mind, it was two E's, but literally that's like Mr. Softy, the ice cream cone, which is gross. So um, this is so funny to me that even at the very end of the book in this like momentous occasion, that here is where we have that little echo of, of um, you know, the anti-capitalist kind of screed. Okay, up at the top here after the mom says she got her the, the teenage softies. Good, I said. Now look, Margaret, here's how you do it. The pad fits inside your panties and... Mom, I said, I've been practicing in my room for two months. Then my mother and I laughed together and she said, in that case, I guess I'll wait in the other room. Which is so cute. Like I, the mom, they're, they're, it, this is not like a super fuzzy relationship. Like it's not like a really warm and fuzzy relationship, but it feels very much like, a, you know, sort of a typical and, and, and like this is a mom who's having a lot of strife and who's moving and who has a lot going on. Okay, so then down at the bottom, uh, she's she's very excited about this, and then and she has at the at the bottom of the uh, this kind of penultimate paragraph. How about that? Now I am growing for sure. Now I am almost a woman. And then we have the italicized paragraph that is again her writing to God. Are you still there, God? It's me, Margaret. I know you're there, God. I know you wouldn't have missed this for anything. Thank you, God. Thanks an awful lot. So I like the idea that we started with this idea of giving thanks and we have this giving thanks at the end here too. But what I like, and, and, and she is sort of like, I know you're there because basically like you have granted me this wish, but, but, but like there is this sense of, of God as being there. It's very important to note that there has been a major uh, rebuffing, like a major, you know, refusal to uh, identify and to be satisfied by any organized religion. She has gone to temple. She's gone to church. She even went to confession. She has done lots of different sort of, um, you know, thinking and a lot of different experiencing of, of organized religion. And to all of those, she's like, no, thank you, which is hugely important. I mean, when you think about any kid who has these bigger questions, you know, I think if you had real faith and you were a real adherent to an organized religion, you wouldn't find this particularly threatening. But 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 it's also, um, you know, an important way for Judy Bloom to kind of bring resolution to this very big question of like, are you there, God? So I think she does this really deft thing at the end here where she's saying, are you still there, God? The question still stands, you know, and she says, uh, I know you're there, God. I know you wouldn't have missed this for anything. But 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 she's not saying it's not Judy Bloom is not offering us any real kind of proof. This is just kind of this continued conviction and this continued one sided dialogue. I mean, there's no I certainly was not expecting like some sign of God. And I, I certainly didn't expect, you know, Margaret to suddenly be converted to any religion. But I think this is such a deft handling. Like there still is no voice of God. There's no, it's very much a, a, an unresolved thing, but it is kind of maintaining the hope and, and the idea of, of the possibility of some sort of spiritual communion. Um, I just, I just think it's so good. So good. So um, thank you so much for listening in to my uh, deep dive into Judy Bloom's Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. For those of you who are watching uh, the YouTube channel, if you've been wondering about this picture of me, uh, that is me. I, and I'm about three, maybe. I'm wearing the most incredible bathing suit in this. Uh, just a bathing suit. It's a one piece. It's kind of like patchworky polka dot kind of rick rack gingham kind of a thing. Um, and I am in the bed of a pickup truck that seems to be going very, very fast because uh, I am kind of lounging over what looks like a giant tire 
like a like an extra spare tire, but like a huge one, maybe like a tractor tire or something. And um, I'm really enjoying the sun and I'm enjoying the wind in my hair. And I'm sitting next to my uncle's ex-girlfriend's son, Scotty, who uh, is also enjoying himself in the back of the pickup. We are very young and we are driving very fast in Idaho in the back of a pickup truck, which I think is really, um, you know, I think it's, it's a fitting close to this, uh, you know, I think this real deep dive into childhood nostalgia and to what life felt like. So I hope that you have uh, taken a little trip down memory lane and that you come back to the Foxed page to read something else with me soon. Happy reading. Thank you.